So I would like to start uh, today. Uh, today we have a very special guest. It's Ashby Brown. Um, he's here on my right. Um, anyway, we have to uh, another camera there. Um, so the, <laughs> there's another camera there. And um, well, Asby is, um, for me, it's a kind of, uh, I don't know if you, if you know this word in Japanese, senpai. <laughs> senpai is like, um, like an advanced uh, um, student who has been more experienced, usually, uh, uh, you know, like a, a generation before you. And uh, I think it's very beautiful, the uh, relationship that um, they built in Japan between senpai and kohai, right? That maybe sometimes we don't have it in, in the in the West. So I, it's really an honor for me and uh, uh, to, to introduce him today. And I'm going to just give a, a couple of uh, notes. Uh, he's from the United States, from New Orleans and has been living here since 1985. So I think you uh, enjoy the good old times of the bubble period. Um, most of us came post bubble, right? So I think you have enjoyed or seen another kind of Japan probably. And uh, you, you know, everyone who kind of puts in uh, or tries to Google anything about, for example, Japanese houses or Japanese architecture, uh, will find uh, his name because he has been uh, writing so many books. Just to mention some, uh, he has probably one of the first works on Japanese carpentry, a pioneering work of a Japanese carpentry, also about small houses, about compound housing. And um, the work that we are going to focus today uh, is about, uh, well, the title is Just Enough. Uh, it's uh, one of the recommended books, it's Lessons from Japan, uh, for sustain from Japan for sustainable living architecture and design. Um, he has been also involved in teaching. Hello. <laughs> has been also involved in teaching, has been working at the Kanazawa Institute of Technology for 20 years, and also now is still uh, teaching at the Musashino Art University uh, as a, in the Faculty of Sculpture and uh, in the Architecture Faculty for the Japan's uh, Women's University. And something that we didn't include in his profile, he's also an um, um, environmental activist uh, for an NPO called Safecast, right? So I, I really wonder, you know, like uh, how many hours uh, you manage to sleep every day because you are so active. And I think he's a real inspiration for all of us who came after uh, he came to Japan. And we hope that someday we will be able to kind of achieve as much as he has achieved in his period. So it's really an honor. Thank you so much for coming today. Okay. And uh, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for that uh, kind of overwhelming introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it, Jorge. And uh, I guess um, we, we might mention that, you know, I uh, met uh, Jorge because I had uh, read the book, uh, asked him to, I think he had to give me a copy. and. Uh, uh, it was really interesting. He mentioned the senpai kohai thing, and uh, you know, I saw that and said, "Oh well, that he's they have taken research that uh, I was interested in and have been doing back in the '80s and '90s, and then just really took it to the next level." And we had a very good conversation um, where I was saying something to the effect of, "It was very, very lonely." back then in the 80s and 90s to be talking about these sort of issues of vernacularity and we're joined by us especially Sinbad as well today but um you know what about the the uh positive aspects of the sort of undesigned city of the city that has the immersion city and it was very lonely then but now there's quite a lot of people uh working on that and working that in a very very important way um so today's um presentation is called recapturing the livable city it's difficult to to come up with titles many of you know and uh talking about Edo as a prototype for sustainable urban planning and design uh and i'm going to begin by talking a bit about background and i will cover you know some background issues first uh the slides are taking a while to uh, events there it is a bit of a self-introduction first um so yeah i'm from new orleans and um, have any of you been to New Orleans? Um, no, United States. Yes, uh, it's in the in the context of the United States. It's an old city. Of course, it's the New World, uh, old being maybe about three hundred years old. Uh, but it shaped my perception of what cities can be, how they carry meaning, how they condition us or train us or teach us 
about where we came from, about what's important to preserve, uh, and also how cities and buildings age and, and what that means, how they improve. Uh, so it's a you know very touristic city in many ways, but it's also a very, very livable city. Uh, and I was very happy to have grown up there. Uh, there's a lot of aspects of the environment. There's a sense of aging, as I mentioned, which is to me very similar to the Japanese wabi-sabi sensibility, where we like things that are sort of cracked and peeling. Uh, we like things that sort of talk about uh, where they came from, and even many, many small buildings and small houses can have a, quite a lot of, of dignity. Of course, there are historical reasons for all of this, uh, and that's sort of shaping my, my opinion. The other big thing about New Orleans is that well, we have a massive festival called Mardi Gras, which then activates the city in a very, very different way. It's really like, this is when you see the true heart of the city and these parades uh, go through uh, many, many neighborhoods and almost everyone participates in one way or another and um, in a very open way, emotionally and, and psychologically open way. And this is something that we don't really have in other parts of the United States. And many of you are aware of the, uh, the terrible uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I guess that was more than 15 years ago, um, which uh, destroyed a lot of the city and so the city, uh, particularly low-lying areas, are largely rebuilt since then. Uh, and yet the character persists. Uh, the demographics have changed. Uh, not as a, a large decrease in the Black minority population, which has really affected the culture. Uh, but um, I was just there recently, and of course, it still feels like home. So when I was in university, uh, I attended Yale University. At first, I thought I would uh, study uh, major in theater because I was doing a lot of performing arts at the time, but then had a very good class in architecture taught by Vincent Scully, who passed away recently, a wonderful architecture historian who focused on vernacular, focused on, you know, the life of everyday people. Uh, and then a very interesting sculpture course by a professor who had studied paper making in Japan. And I got, I was starting to learn woodworking and became exposed to or discovered um, Japanese joinery, Japanese architectural carpentry. Uh, there was really only one book at the time by Kiyoshi Seke called uh, The Art of Japanese Joinery. And that enthralled me, photographs like this, uh, and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, fast forward a few years, I was fortunate enough to be able to come to Japan and meet uh, Tsunegasa Nishioka, who was the last, uh, I'd say the last great uh, temple carpenter, Miyadaiku. Um, he was, the, his family was hereditary carpenters of Horyuji Temple in Nara, which is a temple about 1,300 years old, and then uh, took on the work of uh, restoring uh, Yakushiji Temple in Nara, which is also about 1,300 years old. And when I uh, met him, I was initially interested to become an apprentice and become a Japanese carpenter, but I was already like 27 years old, and I learned, uh, you know, sort of about the ethical debt, uh, you know, the need to be prepared to spend seven or eight years simply bowing my head without any possibility of doing any kind of original work, and I was already involved with my original work. So instead, I asked him to allow me to document uh, his project uh, to have access to the site, and he did. And I was able to come back uh, with a grant from the Japanese Ministry of Education, which I think many uh, of the foreign students here maybe also are benefiting from. It's a great program. Uh, I spent about three years uh, researching this project at Yakushiji while uh, I was uh, in the architecture department at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph of me uh, at the time. Um, I look like a baby when I see myself here, but it was, I was in heaven. I was really in heaven. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a life changing moment for me. Um, and that became a book. Uh, I didn't set out to write a book, uh, but I, I did, and it's called The Genius of Japanese Carpentry, and this is something that uh, Jorge mentioned earlier. Uh, what, the photograph here is of the uh, revised edition from 2014, but I guess the edition, the original was published in uh, 1988. Uh, I was still a graduate student, and it was kind of, again, thrilling for me to actually see this stuff in print, and that has become a big part of my work since then. Um, so let's start with this theory that Tokyo is almost perfect. I increasingly feel this way, and I see more and more people, uh, you know, raising this, this notion. Uh, and the things that I like about Tokyo are the things that a lot of people like about Tokyo, back streets, alleys, um, the livability, the fact that they have been shaped by the inhabitants, uh, that they 
um, accommodate new growth and new development without necessarily losing character, although we do see a lot of cases where that does happen. Uh, the greening, the way they're greened, uh, these things, you know, I've lived in lots of neighborhoods in Tokyo, and it's a kind of a wonderful aspect. Uh, it's about people shaping, and I know there's there's a history to this and a, and a, a shift in perceptions over the years uh, where this may be recognized at one point or before that, it was not considered important. Um, but to me, these are some wonderful aspects of Tokyo. Uh, there are more I can talk about other parts of Tokyo that I do like, but uh, I'm thinking primarily of these, this scale, uh, alleyways, et cetera, back streets uh, where normal people live. And when I see these things, having studied Edo for a long time and, and Edo cities and Edo buildings, uh, in these sorts of environments, I feel this strong continuity with the Edo period, certainly in terms of scale, certainly in terms of um, the relationships of buildings, et cetera, certainly in terms of human activity. Uh, and there is this, you know, important notion that, you know, cities, of course, are not the hardware, they're not the, the building materials and stuff, and they're very much shaped by uh, people's behavior and activity and what they promote and what they don't promote. So New Orleans has its own characteristics, Tokyo has its own, other cities have their own, but I feel a great continuity. So I guess the corollary of the next theory is that most of what makes Tokyo livable are aspects it inherited from Edo. And again, this, I welcome all the challenges to that. This is, you know, I'm I'm sticking my neck out here, uh, but that's my own personal opinion. Uh, you know, having been here for a very, very long time, that most that there's a drive to erase the city uh, through development uh, that re refuses to recognize uh, what people actually like about it. Uh, and I think when I look at what people do protect, it's hard. It's very much um, Edo Edo oriented aspects. Um, Maybe some of you are familiar with this notion of circularity. So this is kind of trying to establish uh, some, some background for what I'm thinking about, um, circular design, the circular economy. Um, and I guess we know that, uh, you know, our current system, we're, it's called take, make, dispose. This is the material production system. And this very much, we see this in evidence in, in the city, in Tokyo, for instance, the way it's produced. Uh, and uh, of course, what we're doing is we're taking uh, resources, making through manufacturing, and also there's a utilization of the use phase, uh, and then we dispose of it, which generally means through incineration or landfill, and you know, a lot of Tokyo is landfill, uh, and uh, this has been going on through the, since the Industrial Re Revolution, basically. Uh, previously, it was less so. Uh, the circular economy uh, says, let's just sort of bend that arrow into a loop, uh, and of course, you're going to still have the resource phase where you're collecting things. And hopefully, a lot of these are going to be biological inputs. This means organic materials, natural renewable materials, wood, et cetera. Uh, of course, there will be some that are non-renewable uh, metals and others, uh, but maybe hopefully they can be somehow uh, you know, recycled or used without waste. It would be great if it's based on renewable energy. Um, and again, uh, we have the make phase, the manufacturing phase. And then the distribution phase, which is often underappreciated. Uh, and again, all of these aspects um, are represented within urban design, within the city, uh, within transportation systems, et cetera. Um, I'm hoping that the slides are coming out clear enough. Uh, then the use phase. Uh, and uh, you know, we, again, uh, tend these days to use things for a very short time and dispose of them. Uh, there's a notion, a concept called upcycling, which I first heard uh, from um, the book by uh, William McDonough and his uh, partner who established the uh, cradle to cradle notion that rather than recycling, when you recycle things, like if you recycle a plastic bottle, you can't make new plastic bottles from it. Uh, you can make cheaper plastic and other things, but not a plastic bottle. If you recycle a, a nice glossy fashion magazine paper, you can make newspaper from it. You can't really make you know, new glossy paper and eventually becomes as crappy paper towels and ultimately it's gonna be incinerated or landfill. But upcycling is saying, let's find materials that can actually be returned to the top of this production system uh, in a way that regenerates natural capital. And natural capital is an important concept. Uh, the environment, the ocean, the trees, things that are growing, the atmosphere, et cetera. Uh, so this is the basis of circularity. Uh, it wants to minimize waste, 
Uh, and then there are these smaller loops, like in the use phase, you know, to reuse things, to repair things, to continue uh, their usable life, to redistribute things. Uh, for instance, if you, um, you know, you get tired of your clothes, you bring them to the, you know, used clothes place and someone else uses them, do that with your furniture. This is an important way uh, to make these loops work. Reconditioning, there's more interest from manufacturers to make uh, appliances and things that are reconditionable more easily, where there are sort of modular designs, et cetera. Uh, and this whole kind of system is called circularity. Uh, and, you know, when I... Uh, started to learn about circularity, of course, it really became a common word around 2012 or so. It, it struck me that it was so much like what the way things were done in the Edo period in Japan. And it's seeking to maximize use of minimize waste. Uh, the main ways are, are dematerialization, modularity, modular design, extending the life of products and moving from products to services. Uh, and again, these are all things that are strong characteristics of Edo period Japan, which we see uh, manifested in the city. Uh, and those who are interested, I recommend this text, Towards a Circular Economy, uh, by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, from 2013. And again, this, this uh, it's a good, good text. The MacArthur Foundation has done a lot of heavy lifting on this issue. Uh, and, you know, it, again, it sort of synthesizes lots of other forms of thought or, or ideas, the functional service economy, cradle to cradle, which I mentioned, biomimicry, industrial ecology, natural capitalism, blue economy. Uh, these were all things, some of them had been developed for decades before circular uh, economy became a word, uh, and they all sort of came together in a remarkable way, uh, which shows uh, a lot of potential. So what does that have to do with the Edo period and Edo in Tokyo? Uh, wonderful um, Japanese print by Hokusai viewing the uh, sunset over the Ryogoku Bridge from the Omaya Embankment, 1830s, so it's kind of late Edo period. Uh, and this is, I like this picture for a lot of ways. Of course, it shows the, the bridge, it shows Mount Fuji in the distance, which you could see from the city of Edo, and you could see from Tokyo for a while uh, in the major period. And then in 1945, when the city was bombed and there were no tall buildings, uh, Donald Ritchie, the great uh, film uh, writer from credit and author, he said that he stood in the uh, middle of Ginza, center of Ginza, and saw Mount Fuji. Uh, and then it, it was covered up as the buildings rose again. You can never see it again. And then the people taking the boat, uh, like a taxi, like a bus. It was a very, very waterborne uh, aquatic city. Uh, as we think about, you know, pressing, pressing issues we have today, uh, global warming, of course, is a big one. We can call it climate change if you want. Uh, deforestation happening uh, in lots of places. Uh, running out of fresh water, uh, using too much. Uh, it's not being replenished. Uh, issues of energy, providing enough energy in a, let's say, uh, non-carbon intensive way. Uh, population growth in many places. Uh, again, it's because of this uneven distribution. Uh, often the population growth is, is leading to urbanization as other things are. Uh, food supply, how do you feed the population? How do you do this in a way that uh, doesn't damage natural capital? Uh, what do we do with the waste? And finally, information. You know, How do we figure out what's going on? How do we provide information and the feedback that we need? Uh, and I want to point out that the Edo period had almost all of the same challenges and met them with great aplomb. Uh, they didn't, they weren't dealing with climate change. Well, they were actually, bent, they benefit from very good climate, but the population was like 30 million people. Uh, that's like Venezuela or Poland now. And that's a, that's a very high population. 90% uh, was rural. Uh, the nation always uh, struggled with the lack of arable land for making farms because it's so mountainous, there's just not enough farmland and that farmland becomes urbanized. So that's also shrinking the footprint of the farms and other resources were limited, everything from metals to uh, fuel to everything else. But again, had a good climate, very literate society, more literate than Europe at the time of the United States. Well organized, of course, it's basically a military uh, dictatorship in a way, uh, very, very organized along those hierarchical lines. And there was a strong anti-waste ethic and all those things helped a lot. Uh, and in our uh, day and age, we're very specialized. We think of things like water or the forest, uh, taking a while for the slides to appear, um, energy, um, next will be waste. Yeah. 
things like food. We think we can you can become a, a you know a specialist in any one of these areas without necessarily needing to know anything about any of the others. This is our current day and age, but of course they're all connected. They're all interdependent. Uh, and I, I think you know they all have connections not only broadly but also amongst each other. So for instance, a vector that would connect water and energy would be like hot water. And anytime you make hot water, you are somehow you know doing something that affects both of these things. Uh, and if you can do that in a way that let's say uh, make the hot water that minimizes use of energy, well then you've, you've you've sort of killed two birds with one stone. And there's lots of vectors that sort of connect everything. I think the people of the Edo period, um, they were not scientific in the way that we think of with the scientific method, but there was a great deal of empirical understanding of these sorts of interconnectedness. And I think that affected the way they approached things and, and the kind of solutions that they arrived at. Uh, if you don't recognize and accommodate those interconnections, then you may end up with a catas catastrophic interaction, something like um, sort of the domino effect of, uh, of climate leading to, uh, to disasters. Uh, and the question is, how do you change this or, or flip this potential catastrophe into uh, something that we would call a virtuous cycle, where they actually are reinforcing each other in a positive way? And I think uh, in Edo, what we see are a lot of what we call multi-form solutions. Uh, instead of killing, like we have the expression kill two birds with one stone, but often the Edo was killing four or five or more, finding a solution that really uh, actually bolsters several several aspects of the environment, uh, of the material use at the same time. And this, today, we would call this systems thinking, uh, which is, again, a very interesting specialty. You could become a systems thinker without knowing actually how any of the actual elements work, but it was a sort of uh, emergent sort of empirical systems thinking. Um, in terms of um, ethics, uh, this I, I like this. Uh, this is the water basin at Ryuanji Temple, a famous one. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it. And uh, it's sort of a visual pun. Uh, in the center is a square opening that holds the water. Uh, and that is the character for mouth and as part of several other uh, kanji characters. Uh, it, it can be read, Ware tada tabu o shiru which can be translated at, as all that's important, all I care about is having enough, all I care about is what is sufficient. Uh, it's a very, it's a Zen temple, it's a Zen Buddhist uh, way of thought uh, that is striving to um, get away from uh, attachment uh, and, and this desire to have more, to be more. Uh, and I think, you know, this thinking is, is again, probably in some ways overlaps a lot with uh, traditional Shinto thought which is thinking about what is the place of humans in the world. Um, so there is this sort of ethical uh, foundation throughout society that uh, sort of encourages people to avoid uh, accumulating things. Of course, it was unevenly distributed. There was a lot of consumption, certainly among wealthier merchants, certainly among the wealthier people in the warrior class, uh, but by and large people uh, tended to avoid overconsumption. Uh, Again, to point out, you know, we'll be talking a bit more about the urban population, but uh, you know, the urban population, rural population were largely separate, uh, fairly distinct lifestyles, distinct architecture, distinct forms of land use, et cetera. But there were a lot of shared characteristics and certainly let's say the structural rationale of buildings was similar. Uh, actually, a lot of the techniques were similar. Uh, in the, uh, the cities, you, know, you had a lot of commoners uh, you also had the samurai, particularly in Edo, uh, big population of samurai. You also had clerics, monks and priests, etc. And then others like entertainers and other people who don't really fit in there. Uh, and again, you know, they are distinct in many ways, but there's a lot of uh, shared characteristics. So um, I think I want to talk about what I would call some underpinnings that shape the city and how it was used. Uh, and a lot of them have to do with, let's say, fundamental aspects of civilization and how the terrain itself was occupied and used. Um, basically, we know that Japan, uh, again, we mentioned it was mountainous. This is sort of a typical valley. Um, they, at the, 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 the bottom of the valley would be, originally would have been a forest, a mixed forest, perhaps a marsh or a wetland, but often a forest which has been cut down and turned into rice fields. There would be a river there. Uh, there are surrounding mountains called Satoyama. Uh, you know, the, the, the farmsteads are generally pushed to the edge 
of, of the valleys, but again, depending on the region, depending on the area, you find a lot of variation. Uh, but this is a fairly consistent pattern we find all over the country. Uh, and one of the things that's important is the forest, of course. Uh, and prior to the Edo period, and actually in, including up to the first few decades of the Edo period, there was a massive deforestation uh, where even, uh, you know, it was deforested as far as uh, Tohoku. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, the rulers, the feudal lords, even in the center, uh, you know, the, what's now Aichi and those areas would have to go up to Tohoku to find timber. Uh, and this led to the kind of catastrophic interaction we talked about, where uh, the deforestation leads to landslides, would lead to rivers being silted up, would lead to, you know, the fish dying and then become, becoming unnavigable, uh, and then unpredictable flooding, which is then, uh, you know, damaging agricultural production, which could then lead to famine. It's just this whole akujinkan, this domino effect. But they managed through good policy to reverse the deforestation. Uh, with by, by the, um, I would say, the second half of the uh, 17th century, and the Edo period began in the beginning of the 17th century. So through policy, uh, government policy, and then cooperation on the part of uh, citizens, occupants, and the first thing was to gather information. Uh, how are our forests doing? What do we need to do? Uh, and they did that by having an actual census of trees throughout the entire nation. Now, of course, the the policy would be uh, pronounced by the Bakufu, the central government, uh, the Tokugawa government in Edo. But each um, hung, each uh, you know feudal domain could implement it any way they wanted. This was actually a very important aspect of Edo period governance, uh, where there was a lot of you know independence on the part of the domain. So they would send teams like some samurai uh, to take notes and some local people who knew the place and they counted the trees and they literally decided which ones needed to be kept and they uh, instituted policies based on this information. And again, a very literate society, great publication, uh, very, very much, um, you know, books and reports could be distributed very, very well. So for me, the important thing is the role that citizens played in this, that they are actually monitoring the environment and trying to use it ethically and also restoratively. So in terms of the uh, forestry, the, the depredation, the deforestation began in the 16th century uh, and regenerative forestry was a solution. Uh, and this tree census began in the middle of the century uh, and it involved a lot of closure of forests with things like strict penalties, like a death penalty for entering a closed forest with an ax. Uh, and I asked a specialist uh, a year or so ago, if he thought that was actually, you know, that penalty was actually uh, given out at any point, he said, there's no record of it, but it's simply on the books. Um, one problem with it was that it led to plantation forest, which we still have, monocultures uh, and a great specialization amongst that, but it also led to improved transportation and institutions for long-term monitoring the forest. And, and then back to what we're talking about, this desire to maintain the forest and to minimize overuse of forest led to changes in building regulations uh, and how things were designed. So this is, again, one of the sort of underpinnings. Uh, and among the things that people would do to help preserve the forest was uh, the fuel supply was wood. There was no use of fossil fuels, almost almost zero. Uh, and so uh, people in the rural areas were burning firewood. People in the urban areas generally were burning charcoal. That was made by people in the urban areas. But people would, um, you know, uh, they were not allowed to cut living trees. They had to go in and pick up the wood that had fallen down naturally. And so over the course of, you know, uh, generations living in the same place, you get a very a good empirical understanding of the natural carrying capacity of that particular environment. And this was maintained uh, very, very well. Uh, and this leads to things like uh, designs, the kamado, which is the, the typical Japanese clay uh, cook stove. And of course, this came from mainland uh, Asia originally, but these were designed to be very sophisticated, to burn everything with almost no waste. The pots designed to fit the lid so that no heat would escape and they could burn just about anything. And the ashes would be kept and everything else would be recycled as well. So there was a great a drive towards efficiency there. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, the, the society, the civilization functioned primarily on direct solar energy, sunlight was doing most of the heating and cooling, uh, charcoal was used and economized, kitchens used as Kamado stove. There was also things like commercial food preparation in the city of Edo, particularly 
it's like it was today, uh, like it is today. You could get, you know, someone be walking in the neighborhood, the, the itinerant, uh, you know, uh, peddler selling, uh, selling prepared food, selling noodles, selling sushi, selling almost anything, selling tofu. Uh, there's a lot of ways to preserve things without using energy. Uh, pickling, drying, whatnot, uh, a lot of that, and a lot of food preparation about cooking. Sushi is a great example. You don't need to cook the sushi. Uh, maybe you can't cook the rice. Uh, and we're not talking too much about farms, but they were, you know, masterpieces of sustainable design, and they didn't use the livestock. Uh, and this also is an aspect that comes to play in the city, because uh, we don't have, uh, you know, horse carts. There were ox carts, there were some horses generally used by samurai for riding. Farms often would share a single horse among many households. Uh, the reason being that um, there was not enough arable land, barely enough land to grow food for people and to grow food for livestock seemed to be kind of a conflict with what people needed. So they minimized that. Uh, and again, farms had wonderful irrigation systems. And this is a big story, a very fascinating story in Japan in general, because the, the irrigation systems and the water supply of Edo was actually very, very, uh, very, very sophisticated. Um, I'll go a little bit quickly through this, but supplying wood for the city uh, required, you know, craftspeople, uh, woodcutters, uh, and a lot of this was done in the winter. They would live in little temporary shacks on the mountain, whichever mountain they're in, going to be cutting. Uh, and uh, they, over the over time, they found ways to transport the wood without damaging the forest or damaging the rivers, because this was very important. And one thing is they basically shaped it into square cross section on the mountain. Uh, and there was a lot of you know waste left over, which would then decay naturally, or the local people could come and collect that to use for their firewood. Uh, and then the transportation system was temporary, built on site, dismantled, and then you know then basically it's also lumber, so the lumber would then be sent down the river with the same other uh, wood, and it was based on rafts going down the river, uh, small ones. Then they would be connected. Often they would be like 50, 60 meters long. These long rafts. Uh, these very, very skilled uh, craftspeople, still, well, what do you call the workers who are guiding this thing down, uh, eventually to come to a place like Kiba in Edo, or which is now still exists in Tokyo. And I lived in Kiba when I was a student, uh, crisscross with rivers uh, and, you know, made to be um, you know, a great distribution system for this massive need of timber for the city. And the need was very, very high. One reason is because of the the large number of fires that the city had even uh, in the you know the pre-modern period. So uh, this view of Kiba, the, the horizontal hatched lines, that's the water, uh, canals and basins. It's a kind of a fascinating urban, uh, urban scape, uh, some of which remains, not much of it remains. The main canals do, but the, the basins don't. And as you probably know, the wood uh, lumberyards have been sent to, uh, they, they moved to Shin Kiba uh, more than two decades ago. So to talk about something like water, again, with our current situation, I mentioned we're out, out consuming the replenishable supply, high energy costs for everything from pumping it to using it. Uh, it gets polluted by the way we use it. Uh, most of the, what we use, 70% is for irrigation, for agriculture. 50% uh, or so home use is for toilet and showers, gray water or black water uh, that then needs to be disposed of somehow. Um, just one example of this sort of vectors connecting these aspects of water and energy is the Sento. And um, it was sort of a remarkable, let's call it a design uh, that again, emerged over, over centuries. Uh, it's very similar to if you go to an on-center or center today where you enter, you pay money, uh, and then uh, you know you, you get a little locker to put your, 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 your stuff in, your clothes or whatever, and you go to the changing room. But one thing that's very interesting is that the price of admission allowed you to get one bucket of hot water, just one. And uh, you could go into the bath and the bath could hold you know, 10, 20 people. Uh, and over the course of a day, you may have 200, 300 people taking a bath here, using the same hot water, minimizing the use of fuel. Uh, so this is happening throughout the city and actually throughout the nation. Uh, you can use all the cold water you want, but the hot water, you only get a limited amount. And this reminded me uh, when I first came to Japan, I first went to an onsen uh, where the, the water spout had this little spring activated 
uh, you know, lever where I'm trying to like wash off or shower. And then after 20 or 10, 50 seconds, it shuts off. It, it drove me nuts, but that was the same thinking uh, to minimize the use of, of hot water. And again, hot water is a valuable resource uh, in Japan and we call it OU. It's got an honorific. Uh, the center was a great way to, to minimize the, the waste of energy uh, used to provide it. And again, this is throughout the city. Uh, and again, for heating, uh, home heating, hibachi was common. We know that houses in Japan were built primarily uh, to be easily cooled in summer, naturally cooled in summer. And the cold months, you just would sort of, you know, have a hibachi to keep you locally warm. And this still, uh, I think thinking still is in Japanese heating systems in homes. Um, to talk about materials, uh, we, now, primarily, as I mentioned before, we have this one-way use that take, make, dispose, uh, very inefficient use of energy in terms of sourcing and manufacturing and distributing uh, our materials. A lot of raw materials are in danger of depletion, everything from, you know, you know, uh, valuable metals to uh, certainly even in some places lumber and some places other things as well. And we end up disposing them and paying a lot of money to dispose them. Um, Edo used, I think they were, almost ideal in terms of this uh, uh, full utilization of materials, almost 100% utilization. And one example is rice. Uh, so rice, of course, is grown for food. And, uh, you know, there's the rice panicle and the rice comes out, uh, you, you know, this, this is removed when it's harvested and it has the, the momigara, it has the, um, you know, the hull, which is then removed and that's got a lot of uses. Uh, you could just immediately send it right to be composted or something and back to the agricultural uh, cycle, but it's got a lot of uses uh, such as, you know, uh, for pillows, for scrubbers and a lot of other things. And then uh, it's got the nuke of the bran and the bran is removed and that's got uses for making like pickles and cosmetics and other things. Uh, so these things are used and then ultimately it's the white rice, which is valuable and the you know farmers needed to pay that for their tax but a lot of the stuff went back into the agricultural cycle uh and straw was used for everything rice straw uh you know shoes bags hats you know floor mats uh, raincoats you name it and again you could just compost it make it a fertilizer or mulch you could burn it as fuel when it's burnt the ash is high in potassium so that's got a lot of uses for everything from you know ceramics to metal making to other things uh, and these, this is a very, very full utilization. So it's very, very ideal. And the interesting thing is that the, the rice straw, uh, the wada is actually a byproduct. You know, it's not the main thing, it's just a byproduct. Uh, clothing is another thing, great example. And again, this is these are the underpinnings of the civilization of this thinking. Uh, Japanese clothing, kimono is made from what's called kangono, uh, one long woven piece of cloth uh, which is basically 12 meters long. And uh, unlike our clothing, when you cut it, you, you know, there's a lot of waste. Uh, it's all rectangular pieces, basically. Uh, and there's zero, almost no waste. I mean, depending, some things would be a bit elaborate and you'd have some kinds of things like trousers, et cetera, that would be, but it's basically no waste and a very similar design, what men are wearing and, wearing and women are wearing. And again, it's uh, one size fits all. Little kids can wear a big one and it's easy to take up. So it's, it, again, this is a, uh, pervasive uh, way of thinking throughout the culture, even underwear like men's uh, kundoshi, this is a rokushaku, it's just a long piece of cloth. Uh, you twist it around, wrap it around. Uh, women's was the same, a rectangle piece of cloth, the koshimaki, uh, simple rectangle thing you tie on that. So all of this is kind of waste-free use of cloth. And uh, in terms of redistribution, Edo, uh, people at that time, and certainly in the city of Edo, use a lot of used clothing. People had no problem uh, buying used clothes. Uh, they would get tired of that kimono, they would bring it to the used clothing seller, and then there was like hundreds, 500, uh, if not more, used clothing dealers in Edo. Uh, and this was just, again, part of the uh, fabric of, of the city. Uh, and some of them would be itinerant, you know, peddlers carrying it. Some of them had, had shops as well, but uh, very, very common to do that. Uh, and this uh, repairing and reuse, again, was very pervasive uh, for redistribution. Again, some uh, historians have said there's like a, there were like a thousand recycling businesses in Edo. So everything from, you know, umbrellas and lanterns, pottery and other things. So uh, the, the fundamental thinking was that everything that could be reused should be reused. 
uh, and this reconditioning, this reuse was happening in the city. The city itself accommodated this. Uh, you know, the pillars again, they'd be on the streets uh, and then find coming through the neighborhood and getting the, the get, uh, for instance, or the, the tobacco pipe or whatever needs to be repaired and then repairing that uh, there in public in full view of things like children for whom this is quite an educational uh, experience. Uh, so again, for waste, uh, you know, there was a lot of recycling and reuse of everything. I could just go through the list, but clothes, paper, wood, metal, umbrellas, uh, building materials, uh, tatami, uh, shoji screens, oil, barrels, and they were itinerant repairmen for just about everything. So now we get to talking about the city proper. Uh, just, you know, thinking about these sort of civilizational values in the way of thinking. Uh, and I know a lot of uh, the people here attending today um, have studied the city, have studied the history. Uh, so here's a map of the city of Edo. And uh, it's a very watery city. Uh, it was, there was the uh, Edo Bay and quite a lot of rivers and canals. Uh, it was often likened to uh, like Venice or like Amsterdam. Uh, and again, the rivers were used for everything, for all kinds of transportation, other use. Uh, the uh, green areas from Edo extended, you know, around where Shibuya is now. And as you get past Ueno, where that is now, this was basically farmland. Uh, not strictly, not only, but basically farmland. Uh, there were a lot of green areas, which were the, the temples and shrines, and the major ones, uh, Kaneji Temple, which is at Ueno, and Zojoji, which is now near Shiba Koen. Uh, and geomantically, these were the uh, east and west, so protecting the east and west flank of the city. Geomantically, the city was rotated uh, so that Mount Fuji becomes the, you know, the, the protective mountain. Uh, and uh, Edo Castle will be in the center. And immediately surrounding it were the uh, the land, the residences of the uh, daimyo. So there was about 200 feudal lords, daimyo, who had uh, uh, generally different residences of different size, depending on their status and the wealth of their domains. Uh, and then everything coming up in yellow uh, were the other samurai districts. Uh, so pretty much that's you know what we call Yamanote. And uh, the, the commoners, the townspeople, uh, were kind of squeezed into the low-lying land. A lot of it was reclaimed land, uh, and also along the major roads, because there was, uh, of course, a very important road network that radiated out from uh, Nihonbashi, and uh, so down to Kansai, up to Niko, up to Tohoku, uh, down to the Nakasendo. And uh, it's a very interesting, and. I think many of you probably know this, that uh, it was a spiral city plan. Actually, the configuration of the canals, many of them, which, you know, the moats and uh, canals, they used uh, natural waterways as much as they could, but it was a spiral plan, uh, and which had a lot of advantages. It's fairly, fairly un unparalleled in city planning. Uh, it was never fully realized, uh, never really grew the way it was intentionally intended to grow. Uh, but in terms of population and versus land use, the population, uh, about 50% were samurai. Uh, and uh, those samurai uh, used about 30% of the land. About 44% were commoners, uh, but they had only 18%, less than 20%. So there's a huge disparity here. Uh, and of the samurai, the, uh, the top 200 daimyo, you know, they used, uh, I'm sorry, they used rather 30% of the land. So they used a lot. The other samurai had a lot, but not as much as the daimyo, and the commoners didn't have much at all. And the rest was uh, shrines and temples, et cetera. So this is this huge disparity. Again, since it's a hierarchical uh, feudal society, this is sort of expected by them. And if we can look at the map and overlay a current map on it, um, you know, the samurai were living in what we call Yamanote, literally uh, neatly encompassed by the current Yamanote line. So, as I mentioned earlier, the city was very, very water oriented. Uh, and it's kind of hard to imagine now if you see the city to try to picture 
the number of boats, the kinds of activity, uh, again, transportation, work, uh, leisure, entertainment, et cetera, and Nihonbashi having been the center. And it's interesting to know that uh, the project has now begun to remove the you know, expressway from above Nihonbashi and try to restore it, kind of based apparently on what was done in Seoul uh, a few decades ago. Um, now, if you're in Tokyo, it's almost impossible to understand the degree to which the landscape and natural landmarks shaped the city and shaped the, the, the vistas and the orientation of roads. This is uh, a drawing of Atagoyama, which if you go there now, there's a big Mori building or a couple of Mori buildings around there. You can't even see the Yama, uh, but this used to be very, very prominent in the landscape when it was primarily uh, two stories. And again, there's natural hills in this thing, which sort of, uh, you know, very, be very, very visible uh, from a distance. Uh, it was an incredibly dense city, uh, more dense than uh, the great, the, more, the densest parts of Tokyo now. So, uh, like 68,000 people per square kilometer, uh, whereas like Toshimaku, which is the densest in Tokyo now, is about 22,000. Uh, and the residential districts were very efficient and pretty modular with good services. Again, bringing everything you might need, uh, taking away everything you don't need, and they managed to find room for gardens. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with Kanda, which was again this the, the heart of the the commoner district, uh, and it it maintains its uh, square grid pretty well. Uh, that was based from the, the early Edo period, actually even before the Edo period. And initially these blocks, they were 120 meters, so Rokuchu Ken, 60 Ken, uh, and the, the property, uh, you know, the actual plots were like 20, uh, 20 Ken deep, and the center was an open space initially for a fire break, but those gradually got built in. Uh, and depending, you know, I think the, the first idea was that it was going to be a square thing, but uh, uh, alleys apparently sort of naturally appeared, uh, and that became part of the fabric. So it's kind of interesting to go into uh, Kanda now and find where those old alleys uh, still exist. Uh, if you look at one particular, uh, you know, site, uh, one particular, uh, you know, piece of property, um, it was very typical. It was a long rectangular thing with shops on the street fronts, and usually one would be owned by the owner of the, you know, the property themselves. And then was the nadaya, the tenements, and uh, you know, these are small one-room rental apartments. Uh, I think. One historian a few years back said that uh, calculated like two thirds or more of the population of Edo lived in a Nagaya, uh, which again, if, if you think of 1.3 million people, that's a large population living in these rental apartments. And they weren't slums. I mean, it depended on the, the property owner, uh, how well they maintained it, how old they were, but basically you'd see a lot of what we'd call middle class people uh, living in this way. Uh, and there's a lot of characteristics that we think of and sometimes romanticize, but I think they actually very, very functional. Uh, so this would be, you know, shops here, which are now eliminated, and that's an alleyway of protected entry to the center courtyard. Uh, and then the long uh, apartment buildings with probably 10 one room apartments in each, and then uh, houses on the other side as well. So this long linear, uh, uh, arrangement, of course, a lot of variation depending on the exact composition. Uh, and the shared features are, are worth noting. Uh, so, um, of course, there was the water supply, and we'll talk about that more. So the, the, the well was also a social area. Uh, there was the toilet. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there was a, a rubbish bin, uh, often with not much rubbish, someplace to hang your laundry, maybe a little shrine, maybe something else, and a lot of variation and not a lot of privacy. Uh, and I think this uh, shaped a lot of uh, behavior uh, that we see still today in, in Japanese uh, communities and how they deal with privacy and those issues. So a typical Roku mat, Roku Joe, uh, one room apartment, a very, very small kitchen still has the Kamado, has a sink, uh, but some things that it's very smoky, uh, like you're gonna go grill fish, you probably do that outside the alleyway. There was a, a drain, uh, for wastewater, but nothing from the toilet, right? This is just what we call gray water going back through this uh, channel of drain, drains uh, into uh, back into the river or to the bay. Uh, and again, within the, the uh, living space, things needed to be compact and movable. And again, this has had a huge impact on Japanese design, I think, to this day. Uh, back to the well and the other issues. Um, the water supply again was remarkable. Uh, they it took a long time to build the aqueducts. 
from the, for instance, the Tama River, there were basically four separate aqueducts, uh, but they were, you know, from very, very far away uh, as open channels. You still have the Tamagawa Josui, which if you go in Western Tokyo, this, it's become a wonderful place to walk, beautiful green thing to walk on. And then as it enters the city, it went underground. So these are not wells per se, but big barrels, big water barrels, and the water could be uh, reached out. And these were actually fairly easy to maintain. Uh, and again, a lot of the, the construction was very similar to what I see in boat construction, using similar ways to similar hardware, similar nails to connect boards edge on edge. Uh, and, and they could, you know, if there was a problem, you could, you know, stop, put a stopper in one area, empty out the water, go in there and repair it. So uh, in a place with lots of earthquakes, it was a very flexible system uh, and worked pretty well. Uh, toilets, you know, again, uh, this is an example of killing several birds, a multi-form solution. Uh, in the beginning, uh, if uh, land owners, property owners in the city, in Edo, would have to pay someone to clean out their toilets. Again, this is, uh, you know, still are toilets like this now in some parts of the city, uh, you know, it needs to be emptied out. Uh, but over uh, decades, uh, it, the farmers realized that this was a very, very good source of fertilizer for their farms. Uh, and would come initially and say, I'll clean it out for you, uh, you know, and you don't have to pay us. And then I was like, I'll clean it out for you. And we'll actually give you some vegetables for that. So every year they'd come and bring a lot of vegetables for the, the right to clear this out. And then there were bidding wars. I said, like, no, we'll pay you money for this shit. Literally, we'll pay you money. Uh, there were brokers, there were transportation systems, uh, and it led to great, um, you know, increase in agricultural production. Uh, and it was sort of killing three birds. So, you know, they're going with the buckets and there's a very standardized system uh, and transportation uh, networks for this stuff and specialized boats to carry it. And I mentioned the brokers, et cetera. And so this was killing three birds. So one, it's uh, making the city clean uh, as opposed to like Europe and uh, North America at the time where there was lots of cholera from these huge uh, waste pits in the city. Uh, so this was keeping it very, very clean. Uh, there was uh, increasing the production of food, right? Better, it's a better fertilizer than anything else they had at the time uh, and uh, generating you know, economic activity. So people are making money on it. So that's like three birds with this one idea of simply using that stuff. Uh, and you didn't need a sewer system. Uh, it didn't contaminate the rivers. I mentioned that the gray water would go back to the river, but that was not very polluting, really. Uh, but you, not like in, in the West, where you know certainly in the 19th century, the flush toilets uh, became very, very important for, for hygienic reasons within the household, but at the expense of this massive uh, pollution of the rivers requiring us to then treat the water before we can drink it, et cetera. So this was kind of a remarkable uh, development. Um, I mentioned earlier, that, um, you know, of course, Japanese houses, Japanese buildings were primarily designed to make them naturally cooled in the summer uh, at the expense of being cold in the winter. Uh, and things like the sliding screens, the shoji and fusuma played a big role in shaping how the wind would go. Um, there's a bit of a difference between Kyoto, Osaka, and, and the Edo region. Uh, we probably know about Tsuboniwa, these small gardens in the center of the house. Uh, in, for instance, the Kyoto region, they often are very, very beautiful. They're also a, a microclimate. Uh, it's a moist microclimate, it's cooler, it's shadier. Uh, the breeze that would come through there is actually cooled some bit by that uh, and helps cool the interior. That wasn't possible in Edo. Uh, it was possible in, in, in Kyoto Osaka because the, the lots were much deeper. Uh, so they could have that, but they didn't have that in Edo, but there would then be rear gardens and often a building, uh, a kura, a storehouse at the back that functioned in the same way. So you have this great natural cooling. Of course, the city is very much, uh, especially the, the common city is a lot of canals uh, and a lot of uh, waterways there that are also helping to cool. Uh, and one thing I think is really worth thinking about, and I talked about this in terms of circularity, is what happened to a demolished building. Uh, and again, most of you probably know that Japanese traditional wooden architecture can be dismantled. It's held together by wedges and pegs and mortises and tenons. Uh, it largely can be dis dismantled and the parts be used. And in fact, for things like large timbers, the large beams and large col columns, there were lumber yards in Edo and other major cities that dealt specifically in reused timber. 
uh, where for a lot of things you wanted to build, you didn't need new timber. You could go to the used timber uh, yard and get what you need. Of course, it's a modular design, so often you could find something that would fit with a minimum of modification. Things like floorboards were often very, very thick. You could plane them uh, clean and then reuse them easily. Uh, roof tiles, of course, had a very, very long life, and even if you weren't going to reuse them on a roof, you could use them in your garden. Uh, things like cedar shingles, they made great tinder. They were very, very prized for people to use to start their fire. Anything of metal. Metal was generally in short supply. Iron was practically a uh, precious metal, so those would be carefully, carefully conserved uh, and reused and melted down. And of course, Kusuma and Shoji and other panels and even tatami could simply be taken from one house and put into another and reused very, very simply. Uh, foundation stones were very carefully selected. Uh, so, you know, if you found a good one, then you would want to reuse that as well. And the, the clay from the walls was also reused. In fact, uh, the craftspeople who did clay walls, even now, they, they uh, by, by, by practice, use a certain percentage of old clay to mix them with the new clay uh, to give it the right consistency. So this is... Um, an incredible, almost total reuse potential for the entire building. And you could dismantle the building, and because there's generally no deep foundations, you could build a garden there the next day, or even the same day if you want. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, again, throughout the culture, throughout the city. So uh, the, the buildings have this very low ecological footprint to begin with, uh, natural cooling, good use of sunlight, uh, compact, flexible design, no cellars, they're just resting on these foundation stones, using a lot of earth materials where, where possible, uh, and roofing design, of course, steadily improved in, in terms of fire, uh, fireproofing, fire resistance, and uh, weight and those things, and uh, everything designed to be dismantled uh, with standardized dimensions and lots of resale value for everything else. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with something called buildings as material banks. Uh, it's very, very worth looking into. Uh, this is what Edo did. Uh, now, buildings as material banks, uh, there's a lot of interesting proposals for uh, designing buildings that can be done this way. How do you make new material use, new construction methods that allow the building to be easily dismantled and all those things reused? And I think uh, it's very, very worth looking into. And what it allows is uh, uh, they're talking about flexible and transformable buildings, uh, buildings with functions as banks of valuable materials, uh, since valuable materials are easy to access and recover, uh, resource efficient maintenance, uh, and reversible building design. That's to me the key notion, and this is what Edo did uh, almost everywhere, reversible design. Uh, you build it, but it's not going to be there forever, and there is actually benefit to reversing it, uh, and it, it's fairly, fairly simple. Um, so I think we're getting towards the end of my part of the presentation, but uh, we can talk a bit about the lifestyle of samurai. Again, this was a, a very non-egalitarian society. We can't stress that enough. Um, I would not want to live in Edo. Uh, you know, even if I was a samurai, their life, lifestyle actually had a lot of problems. Um, you know, there was just no notion of equality and no notion of real self-determination for most people. Um, the samurai, they had the best real estate. I think I showed you uh, what I didn't mention was topographically, they were living on the hillsides, you know, so the land was well drained. Uh, they had better sunlight, they had better breezes, uh, and the estate, the, the, the land of the, the daimyo, the 260 daimyo, were bigger than all of the commoners, the, the million something commoners. So that's kind of uh, ridiculous in a way. Uh, samurai, as time went on, and there were no wars, uh, this long period of peace, they were underemployed. Uh, and underpaid. They were basically, they had fixed stipends based on perhaps their grandfather or great-grandfather, and there was constant inflation, so they couldn't make ends meet. Uh, but they had enough property for a house and a garden, and uh, and together, because they used so much land in the city, that uh, along with the temples, etc., made a big uh, green canopy. And if you were to look at a samurai district in Edo, um, I should really color this image in someday, but uh, you know, it looks like a, a, a contemporary housing housing development. Uh, little houses and little gardens and little trees and, and streets going back and forth. It, this is, uh, uh, where is this? This is in Western Tokyo, uh, where it was kind of gridded, but many places it was more irregular. And the streetscape was one, uh, unlike the commoners where the, the shop fronts were on the street, the streetscape were walls and gates. 
and you can see the gardens behind. So often I'm walking through Tokyo and I see places that still have that resonance uh, because one thing that happened was uh, after the Meiji period, uh, you know, before the Meiji period, only samurai were allowed to have gates. Uh, it was a sign of status, and this was there were very strict sumptuary laws of who could have what kind of gate and how big and what materials and what finish. But as soon as the major period happened and the samurai were dispossessed and uh, disenfranchised, then suddenly anybody could have anything as long as they could pay for it. So now we have a lot of people with gates, which was actually a samurai thing. Uh, and again, this is uh, if you go in Reno Park, uh, there's one the only extant gate from Edo of a daimyo, uh, a villa, the Akeda clan's gate is there, uh, but compared to lower rank samurai, I mean, there's still gates, but of course there was a lot of, um, let's say, ideological and status uh, significance uh, happening with that. Um, the Japanese room, the zashiki, lots of people want one. Uh, I think uh, it's probably underappreciated the degree to which this was associated with samurai. Uh, prior to the major period, prior to the modern period. Uh, other other ranks could have it. If you were a wealthy farmer, you could probably have a zashiki, especially if you're the rank where you needed to have samurai coming to visit you from time to time. And the zashiki was designed to be appropriate to visit for, for a visit from someone of a higher rank than you. But uh, the key thing to keep in mind is that it it's, uh, forms a, a unit with a garden. Uh, they're never designed uh, in isolation. It is The zashiki is a place from which you see the garden. And I think about you know the, the history of samurai as being initially uh, rural people, even farmers, uh, and prior to like the Edo period and certainly going back centuries. Uh, and I, I I'll often think that this, this is some to some degree uh, kind of a reminiscence or this desire to recapture the sense that they're still living uh, close to nature somehow uh, in in the in the mountains in the woods. Um, houses, there was a lot of variability. This is sort of a low-ranking samurai. Uh, their income is based on koku. Uh, I would say this was, a, which is a bushel of rice. This is the plan, based on the plans we know from um, Okachimachi in Tokyo. And it, it, Edo is also called Okachimachi. And uh, uh, the plan, the, the basic outline of the, of the house uh, survives. And uh, I, I worked with uh, experts uh, in samurai uh, houses to sort of try to fill in the details, but uh, there would be like three entries, the main one through the gate, the main entry there, the genkan, uh, and then an informal one for the family members, the tomariguchi, and then often a mizuguchi, a little kitchen entry, a little kitchen garden, and there would be like the toilet out there in a well, uh, and then uh, a sequence of rooms, so the zashiki is here, and often there is a toilet uh, to the side of the zashiki, intended for the guest, Right, and sometimes I've been to samurai houses like one in Matsui recently, and I'm there in the house, and I see the the engawa, and I see, I said, that's where the toilet is, right? <laughs> because you can tell that was just typically good good manners for the guests. Uh, and then the living rooms or the study, and again, they would often be be shifted in function depending on uh, the occasion. But often the the master of the house would have a study. Uh, so kind of an ima, and then a kind of nema, a place where the family actually would sleep. Uh, the kitchen would be very small, and often a storage unit. So the, the houses were fairly minimal, but livable. I mean, a lot of us could live in this sort of sort of layout very, very easily today. Um, more interesting to me was how they treated, let's even call it the landscape around the house. And again, this would be one house in a, an entire area, neighborhood filled with similar houses. Uh, trees were carefully selected as they were in the rural areas uh, to provide windbreaks, also to provide food, nuts, fruits, etc. And some uh, fruit trees are also ornamental. So there were ornamental trees as well. Uh, and originally the gardens would have a water feature, invariably a water feature, which of course uh, also becomes habitat for, for, I mean, you could put in fish, uh, but eventually frogs and other animals would come there. Uh, Interesting thing was that because of the inflation and the fact that a lot of samurai families, especially lower ranking ones, couldn't really make ends meet on their income, uh, their, their fixed income, they started to grow their own food and, and often converted the ornamental garden into you know, half of it or more into uh, a, a vegetable plot. Uh, now, they couldn't um, sell it. Uh, they were prohibited actually from doing business, but this led to you know what we call suso wake, 
distribution of surplus. So you would give them to your relatives and your neighbors, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and again, they, the samurai were probably very competitive. Uh, I'm just, this is a picture of a kitchen, let me go on. Uh, probably very competitive and they're well educated, right? And there were lots of books to teach people how to grow things. So you can imagine a samurai getting a book on eggplant or kabocha, kabocha, which is uh, comes from Cambodia. Uh, so kabocha, the words derived from that. And how do you grow the best one? And they're doing this in a very, very organized way. And there's no sense of shame to that. This is a, a, a totally appropriate thing for a samurai to do is to grow food. Uh, and there is another example in uh, Kanazawa, the Kago domain. At one point, the uh, the daimyo said, uh, "You can no longer buy fish, samurai. You have to catch your own fish." So what the uh, samurai in Kaga did was they started to make something called Kaga kebari, kebari, which are little fish hooks that are what we call fly, they're like fly fish, they look like insects, and they would be, you know, using gold leaf and arushi and uh, soap thread and these incredible little miniature artworks and trying to outdo each other. So they're like, yeah, you tell us to fish, yeah, we'll fish, but they're doing it as sort of uh, gentlemen. Uh, so again, this, uh, you know, the, the ornamental gardens persisted, and I, I uh, as I said, they're very important when you think of this throughout the city as habitat, uh, as helping provide green canopy. But uh, in terms of the food production, if you think of like that, that almost 50% of the city, 30% of the city uh, devoted to samurai estates, um, you know, this was a massive scale of urban farming, probably uh, not seen again until the wars of the mid 20th century. Uh, victory gardens which we had in 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 uh, england and other places so uh, an incredible amount of urban farming one other thing uh that happened in edo was uh because uh gardening was also kind of a nice uh, pastime for samurai and others um they constantly uh, renewed the soil they would have soil brought in from other parts uh, surrounding areas of Edo that was a higher quality and over you know, the course of a century or two actually improved the quality of the soil. Uh, and this again, when we talk about replenishing natural capital, that's a wonderful example. Uh, the, this is I, this never happens anywhere these days. It's always uh, you know decreasing quality, but they through their effort and it took time they they did that. Um, and I think maybe we'll sort of end with um, you know the daimyo estates. Uh, maybe you guys know daimyo needed to have three. Uh, yashiki, uh, uh, kami yashiki, so an upper estate, uh, which was like their headquarters. And uh, you probably are familiar with Daimyo Koji uh, near the Imperial Palace now, where Otemachi is, uh, this actually still rectangular blocks, also uh, basically uh, Rokuju Ken, 120 meters. Um, that was just a, ro a rose of these massive uh, estates of the most powerful daimyo. Uh, and they would have uh, be surrounded by a wall, which is like a nagaya, which is barracks for the troops. So they may have 200 or more troops living there. And the big building that is as much of a business and military headquarters as it is a residence. And of course, gardens and uh, you know tea houses and everything else. They would also have a nakayashiki, a middle estate, which is the, the residence of the family. And these would be a little further from the center of, of the city, a little further from, from the castle. Uh, bigger gardens, much more residential design. Of course, they still have a garrison of troops, but we, we still have, uh, again, a uh, uh, larger garden and some of these have still survived. But the remarkable ones are what's called the Shimoyashiki, the lower estates, uh, which were generally on the outskirts of the city and intended to be emergency uh, uh, you know, places where they go if the city's burning uh, or if there's a war or something and they have lots of storehouses, warehouses for materials, for food, for everything else. And often the largest ones uh, were big enough for wild animals and hunting and horseback riding, etc. And a lot of the gardens like Shinjuku Goen, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Korakuen and other places were originally these Shimoyashiki. Uh, again, they returned back to the public in the Meiji period. Uh, so again, we could talk about, about the virtues of samurai houses, but again, we think of it as ideal. I mean, you look at the zashiki, that living room, and a lot of us can live that way, would like to live that way. Uh, very healthy, um, you know, lots of benefits to the way they provided their gardens, et cetera, uh, producing food for themselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, this thing about growing food and this uh, exchange of surplus, the susawake, this is... You know, part of an overall economic 
uh, structure that was fairly unique. For one, uh, the Edo period economy was a non-growth economy. Basically, as you know, the, city, the, the country was closed, Sakoku, so they are not trying to increase their markets or increase their supplies of raw materials, increase their economic activity in that way. It is basically cl a closed system with, with zero growth. Uh, and one of the key economic, uh, you know, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, sources of wealth is rice. So the rice economy is basic. The farmers are growing it, they're paying it as tax. The samurai are receiving that, the daimyo are receiving that, and then selling that and paying themselves and using that for everything else. Uh, then you have the cash economy with the merchants are doing money. You know, they're, they're doing it all based on money, uh, very similar to our banking systems today. Uh, and, and farmers, for instance, were just discouraged from participating in that, but over, over time they did. Uh, samurai needed money, but they were not supposed to do business. But then you had this distribution of surplus. So kind of a three-tiered economy was happening uh, there. And again, all this was through economic necessity. Uh, when we talk about this, even starting with this, uh, you know, uh, the forests and stuff, well, yeah, there were laws against, you know, cutting trees. But basically, everyone cooperated these things evolve because of economic necessity. There are not a lot of instances where uh, the government exerted a heavy hand to uh, enforce, you know, economizing materials. There were some, the sanctuary laws passed after the great fires, for instance. There are a few examples, but by and large, it was laissez-faire. By and large, people did it because they were benefiting from it. Uh, and then, you know, well, I guess one of the last images here is the, the urban tree canopy. Uh, it was a vast, urban tree canopy that stayed intact pretty much into the 20th century uh, between you know, the samurai houses and the, 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 the temples, etc. Uh, but then as particularly the samurai homes were converted and redeveloped and changed in character, uh, this began to disintegrate. Um, so I might even stop here. We'll go quickly. Uh, there was a great important interchange in terms of material flows between the rural areas and the urban areas, and uh, and they all were part of an overall system based on again the natural capital of the sunlight, the water, the watershed, uh, the, the the forest, etc. Um, and we'll just we'll ask, well, what happened with this wonderful system? It was so great. Why did it fall apart? And uh, it was major restoration, and I would say particularly uh, the rise in the use of fossil fuels, with, which broke an important linkage to uh, maintaining the forest as a, as a key source of uh, natural capital. Uh, population increased, of course, a lot, rising consumer society, uh, and then building technologies that didn't have this clear upcycle path. Of course, this is Western technologies. Uh, brick was fairly upcyclable, but uh, and steel could be very, very uh, upcyclable. But others, concrete and other materials, uh, did not really have that. Um, at the same time, the Meiji government made some very, very wise decisions. I think uh, there was not enough budget to do both, um, you know, a new road system uh, and do a railroad system. They decided to do a railroad system. Uh, and that, I think we still live with the benefits of that. Fantastic railroad system and, and the roads still suck. Uh, and of course, they continue with water transportation as well. And this uh, uh, this ethical, um, you know, uh, encouragement to avoid waste, et cetera, this continues, I think, into the present. Certainly, in well into the 20th century, uh, it's difficult, more and more difficult uh, in the post-war period, but I think it still is visible and evident. So uh, I'll end with saying, you know, the circular economy model adheres so closely to Edo period environmental resource and design principles that Edo can serve as a prototype and inspiration, teaching us that the, teaching us the many benefits of living in a highly developed circular economy. And uh, I will end there. So this is a cover of the new edition of Just Enough, which came out about a year ago. Uh, and I'm ready for questions. I still think we have enough time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Aziz. Thank you so much. Um, I think we can start. I would like uh, maybe uh, Juliana or Jessica maybe check if there are questions online too. And I would like to start with the questions here uh, uh, by the people who are uh, who came today. And I would like you to, if you have questions, to come a little bit 
closer to here, right, Jessica? Oh, why the sound is not going to be like so good. So if you can stand up and come a little bit closer. But um, I, I, I really enjoyed the lecture and um, uh, I, I also recommend you to, to buy the book <laughs> because it's it's full of amazing drawings. These are your drawings. Yeah, those, those are drawings. Like, like super, yeah. I mean, you can spend lots of time like just uh, um, enjoying the drawings. They are so full of detail. And, um, you know, I have been reading many books about Edo, but uh, thanks to your drawings, I, I could at last uh, really understand many things, I must confess. Thank so you. I think this quality, I mean, we, we should be very careful about writing, but I think the power of graphics, the power of drawing is something that your book really um, Thank you. expresses. Uh, yeah? your, yours too. And I'll, I'll just mention this, that um, I, I had some models, um, uh, when I was thinking about this book, and there was, uh, 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 you know, books that I had liked in the past where the story is primarily told through the illustrations, and I wanted it to be something people could absorb a lot uh, by reading illustrations and the captions. Uh, and also, it took a year. The drawings took a year. I mean, I was teaching and doing a lot of other stuff, so I would literally draw until, you know, I would get a headache, a migraine headache, uh, and then, you know, have to stop. So I enjoyed it, but it was very difficult. The other thing being that it required an incredible amount of source material. And I think most of you can appreciate that. Uh, plus, a lot of it was things I knew, places I had visited, I had photographs of that I took myself, uh, things like the, you know, Edo uh, Tokyo Open Air Museum or the Edo Tokyo Museum in, in, in uh, uh, Ryogoku, and then lots of uh, printed sources. As you know, there's a lot, incredibly, a lot of printed sources from the Edo period, uh, you know, about cityscapes, etc. So those were very, very valuable uh, and sort of filled in a lot of the details. So I encourage people to sort of make use of that incredible resources that are available. Um, I was only able to do the book and the drawings because of the work of other researchers who had sort of, you know, made this stuff available and accessible. Okay, uh, so let's start with the questions and. Um... I think uh, some people online. That yeah, okay. Let's start right. first with the people here uh, in the classroom. Here, and then and um, I, 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 which one would you prefer? I cannot see uh, what I see. Hands, yeah. uh, but uh, so I, I cannot avoid like looking at uh, Jordan San, who is. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm very curious to start. hear. I'm very yeah. curious about. I mean, you're but, not going to escape. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's start with yeah, the students. But I'm very curious to hear where. Professor Sam disagrees with me because, <laughs> you know, it's quite a lot of knowledge about this. I know. So, okay. So, first of all, any questions from here? From the there was one online here. Okay, okay. Yeah, online. Okay. Why were sellers not up in old Japan? Well, that's an interesting question, but they had never been a thing. I mean, the, basically, um, prehistoric. I'll say prehistoric. Prior to the introduction of the you know, mainland. Asian architecture, you know, from China and and, and uh, Korea, the Korean Peninsula in the sixth century or so, um, people lived in pit dwellings, you know. Uh, so they would dig a pit on a meter deep and then build the, the the structure above that. So there were something like a cellar in the prehistoric period, and that perhaps persisted uh, later than you may think, um, you know, in, in certain rural areas. But it was the East Asian uh, way of building. That was to put the buildings on a foundation above the ground. And uh, I think you may find examples of, uh, let's say, secure storage places or secure places, you know, to hide in or to avoid theft. You'll find some small things that are sort of like cellars in some cases, but uh, it was simply, I, I think, climactically, the benefits of having the building built above the ground so breezes could go through were so clear. I think it was never really um, no necessity for building cellars in that way. So I hope that answers the question. And uh, we have two people that would like to participate. So how about, I can't read her last name, but Anastasia Glocomi, yes. Maybe she wants to go. Yes. Okay. Oh, hello, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brown, and um, I would like to thank Jorge for uh, letting us in uh, side KO in, in this format. Uh, I'm sorry I could not be there, um, but uh, it's very nice to join online, and I really thoroughly enjoyed your uh, presentation. And I, I have, I, I think it's two comments, but they connect into a question. Um, so at the beginning, you mentioned that um, Tokyo is perfect. And- Almost. Um, 
Almost perfect. Almost perfect. Uh, okay, so the almost is the hint, which at the end uh, you sum up with the, the unraveling from the Meiji Restoration era. Um, and you mentioned that uh, in the Meiji Restoration, uh, the moving away from the upcycle model is part of the, of the challenges that start uh, for, uh, for Tokyo in terms of sustainable living, as I understood it. Uh, and I'm just wondering, um, have you um, considered or um, what do you think about, for example, how this change uh, to moving away from the upcycle model may have had uh, an effect on the nature of uh, community life, uh, as you showed uh, very nicely in your drawings, uh, there was a certain density that was made possible because people lived uh, communally. Uh, and then that was uh, with the import of the Western, let's say, not the Western, the modern technology, uh, the density remains, but some of the communal ties are cut. So I guess I'm wondering, what does it mean for Tokyo like how Tokyo is almost perfect because maybe uh, community life has been replaced by the nuclear family, but then the density is the same and then the relationship between the inside and the outside has been kind of severed. Uh, are some thoughts and reflections I had from your presentation? Um, uh, so if I'm understanding your question, it's, um, you know, what sort of changes occurred as, um, let's say, Tokyo uh, began to uh, move away from or develop in ways that um, made this kind of community interaction uh, more difficult or less common. Is that the question? The primary, the primary uh, question. Yeah. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. Let me let me let me let me summarize it. Uh, I think uh, you focus on the material aspects of what changes and yeah. the, the processes, yeah. but maybe also what do you think about the the relationship of people that yeah. changes and then how yeah. that affects yeah. Tokyo. So. When I think about what's changed, I, I often try to focus on what are the benefits that people perceive by doing things in a certain way. And um, in, in my own neighborhood, um, you know, uh, there is a, so I, I live in Yokohama in the neighborhood where my wife grew up, where my mother-in-law grew up. They've been there for generations, but it's in Yokohama, so it's like a village. In Yokohama, it's very weird, a lot of relatives around, and there's a lot of people who have been living there for a very, very long time, and uh, they know each other, and it's not so different from this, what we think of this old-fashioned sort of social, you know, mutual responsibility and communicating about, you know, what needs to be done, uh, but then new people come in and do not have that connection, and they tend to be more private. And what I see is a great, um, uh, let's say, prioritization of privacy uh, over this communality. And I think one of the reasons is uh, we are so annoyed by unwanted contact. Uh, if you're open to, you know, basic community interaction, that means you're also going to be open to uh, people trying to sell you things and scams and, you know, all sorts of other stuff. So I think privacy is this protective instinct. And I see that uh, manifest very much in how houses are built and, and this notion of gates, et cetera, very, very much so. Uh, when I lived uh, in Kanazawa, when I was teaching, I lived in apartments of three or four different apartment buildings and rarely knew the neighbors. Uh, and I think, again, uh, partly the construction style, uh, the way the circulation works into the apartment buildings um, sort of mitigates against having that kind of connection. This is all why I look very closely at the rise of shares uh, in Japan. And in Tokyo has quite a few, and there's, as you know, designers who specialize in this, uh, where people are, you know, particularly uh, trying to address this isolation, uh, more so for people who are living uh, single, uh, where they want to have contact with people. And how do you design in the current age with the technology we have, perhaps um, with retrofitting or, or, or renovation of buildings, how do you design a way that actually can promote a better social interaction? And there's a lot of examples. Again, in terms of the overall market and, and the kind of, uh, let's say, building stock, it's a very, very small, small percentage. But I think it is a clear and visible trend as well. Uh, so it, it's I don't think there's anything inherent in the materials used, for instance, that means that people are less likely to communicate. I think it has to do with 
how do you envision social relations and how do you address these issues of need for privacy and security uh, and people being able to opt into social interaction. Uh, and again, to, 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 you have to mention that uh, these Japanese neighborhoods in the Edo period, uh, they had sort of mutual responsibility. There was collective punishment. If somebody did something wrong, everybody would get punished for it. In the, the, the 20th century, in the pre-war period and during the war, there was collective responsibility, collective punishment. If one family was playing jazz records, the whole neighborhood would be punished. So this was a terrible aspect of it, a kind of enforced uh, mutual responsibility. And I think uh, this also is one of the reasons why people wanted to get away from that uh, sort of, you know, let's say enforced, you know, communal relationships. I, I hope that answers it to some degree. Uh, yes, uh, even more than I expected. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Grace Lynn? Yes, hello. I'm sorry, am I audible? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. And I learned a lot precisely because I study urban governance here in Paris. Mm -hmm. And so I actually have many, many questions, but I'm just going to limit it to um, two points that I want to ask. Yeah. So uh, my question here is, do you think that we are entering an era of degrowth in a sense that we're kind of moving away from the notion of progress and transcending into some sort of ideas like such as closing feedback loops or uh, precisely that you mentioned in circularity. And I'm pretty sure you are familiar with the ideas of donut economics by Kate Raworth. And in this sense, like if yes, you do think that we are entering an era of degrowth, would this be criticized as sort of like, and this is my second question, as like a, like a global North sort of centric ideal. And in a sense that it kind of only applies to countries that have already won the race in the industrial revolution and yeah, that's just kind of my question here. Um, yeah, good question. Um, you know, degrowth, there is a, a lot of people, you know, economists and other theorists and political scientists talk about degrowth. Um, and, you know, I guess it depends on how you envision it. And when we talk about something like circular economy, you know, does that necessarily imply degrowth? I mean, what are we talking about by degrowth? And I think um, certainly um, it implies or suggests or encourages um, better approaches towards obtaining resources and use of resources and energy. And uh, our economy for, for, for a long time throughout the certainly industrial period, but probably since this current, current economy began to evolve centuries ago, uh, was really focused on expanding markets, expansion, etc. So um, that may be something that could occur. Uh, but um, I don't know that uh, degrowth is the goal of that necessarily, um, but it could well happen to some degrees. And I think we should expect these things to happen unevenly. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, the developed nations, which now, you know, uh, maybe it's a luxury that they can think about uh, this sort of thing, whereas other, other nations actually ones who suffer the most under, let's say, colonialism, this exploitation for materials and uh, labor, you know, they have a great incentive to do this as well. And maybe some of them can leapfrog some of the steps that other economies have gone through in order to try to achieve that. Um, but, um, you know, I think there is a need to question or, or to really recognize face on the consequences of this growth paradigm uh, that we have been living with for for such a long time. Uh, and we also see a tremendous resistance to recognizing that. I see this politically in my own nation, the United States, uh, fossil fuel companies maintaining this incredible influence on government uh, where it should be clear that, you know, we should be trying to minimize the use of fossil fuels. Um, yeah, so I think, I don't know if there's any, any clear answer, but to me, the Edo model of, I mentioned these sort of three tiered economies sort of coexisting, and, and serving different needs. To me, that's very interesting. I think there is a lot of potential there. Uh, I think anything we might do would look different. And I, I don't want people to think that I'm saying that, oh, the new solutions we should come up with should look like these. I think we need to look at them on a functional basis and see how they actually function. If they, they work with the same kind of information, same kind of understanding of systems, et cetera, uh, the actual results 
should be the solutions should be different. They will necessarily be different, uh, but we need to see if we can make things function the same way. And and again, a simple example would be, um, you know, uh, can you find a way to do urban development that improves the quality of of the soil of the ground, for instance? Can you build factories uh, where the water that comes out is cleaner than the water that goes in, for instance? Uh, there's many many examples in Edo that sort of give you paradigms uh, for us to try to achieve. So uh, it's a good question. And uh, I maybe if you want to stay in touch and tell me what you're researching, what you're finding, I'd like to hear uh, about what you're finding. Anyone else? Uh, there's another Q&A here. OK. Oh, single? Maybe Jordan, we can come a little bit closer. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, the sound is. Yeah, yeah this is the. Uh, the mic How are you doing? Long time no see. I haven't before. seen Jordan Sand in 30 years, probably. We, 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 were, we were classmates in the architecture yeah. school. I told I way back mm -hmm. when. Uh, um, and I feel a little like um, 35 years or whatever it was. The, yeah, should I, you, oh, should you should come over here because yeah. this is the mic that goes online. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 We just leave it. No, we can. Yeah. What, yeah. Okay. Okay. As long as you're close to it. Yeah. What's happened is that. The rest of Japan has finally caught up with Asby Brown, <laughs> um, which is great because a lot of this also is it's it's the zeitgeist here mm. to some extent right now, and I think that's something we should all talk about. Um, but let me first you invited me mm -hmm. to correct you, which is an opportunity one rarely gets. One one rarely gets in such an invitation, mm -hmm. um, and so as a fellow Edo Tokyo historian, I'll say a couple of things that. Um, kind of by way of corrective, suggesting uh, opportunity for further research, but they also dovetail with a point you made toward the end, which I think is important to thinking about this as a civilization or a system, which is that the Tokugawa government was actually, in a sense, laissez-faire uh, with regard to a lot of economic activity. They didn't make the economy their business. And that's important to understand. And so the two correctives are uh, came up uh, along the way. One is the spiral plan. This is a theory uh, espoused by a very major Edo historian named Naito Akira years ago. And it's very intriguing, but there are no documents from the time that said, let's lay this city out in a spiral. It's really intriguing, but mm -hmm. it's one of these sort of mysteries that after the fact, somebody said, maybe this was going on. I've always been a little questioning of it because I don't think that the authorities thought about a whole city plan. They thought about where to put people. Mm -hmm. They put their people right around their castle. They left the residual space for the poor commoners. But I don't think they had a planning vision. That's my read. So it remains to be researched further, but it doesn't go against the overall tenor of the talk. The second is recently I've read Saito Osamu, I expect you know. The uh, original source on the uh, forestation story in the Tokugawa period was the historian Conrad Tottenham. We mm. have a book in English called The Green Archipelago, still a very significant book. Um, Tottenham really emphasized, again, government policy, smart forest management on the part of the Tokugawa regime. Very strongly made case. But Saito, going back to the 17th century, says, no, you can see even more important laissez-faire mm -hmm. activity, that is, new books about forest management circulating in the 1680s and so forth, people locally picking up on this knowledge and circulating it, did more, in Saito's argument, I'm not sure if he's got it right, did more than Tottenham has recognized, and maybe more than the government itself did in terms of policy making. So once again, going to your final point, right, that the government maybe is not the source of all of this interesting civilizational stuff going on. We need to think about the circumstances in which an economy like this came to function the way it did, right? And that, uh, for better or worse, policy might not be leading the way all that much. That's my uh, criticism. My question for you is your writing to influence practice today and in the future. You're an activist more than I am. I'm happy staying in the past all the time. Um, and it has this really powerful effect because it's so vividly presented. Um, 
And yet I find myself thinking about Tokyo today, which whether it's perfect or not, I love very much, and thinking what's going on in Tokyo government, Tokyo planning, Tokyo urban management, that's more than window dressing, that shows that, yeah, Edo is not only cool, it has lessons for us. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Uh, great, uh, that's really good observations. Um, and first, before the question, I'll say, yes, I think it's very important what you, you pointed about Naito. And I think you're absolutely right that there is no clear documentation of that, yet the, the evidence seems to be on the ground, but you're right. The planning was piecemeal and opportunistic by and large. Uh, about um, forestry, yes, Topman is great. Uh, that influenced my thinking a lot. And it's interesting that he does talk about both, I would say the light hand of government. Uh, and, and in so many instances, it did exert, the, especially the Bakufu exerted a light hand, uh, sort of, I think more through intellectual influence, through uh, research and publication, promotion of publication, occasionally uh, devoting resources. And the examples that I think I, I mentioned where they were clear uh, prohibitions that were actually enforced. There are a few, but some of them are very, very notable. Again, sanctuary laws are one, and yet they were constantly renewed because they were not effective. So that's also true. Um, and Tama also has a great book on the environmental history of Japan, which is also really ties things together wonderfully. I recommend to everyone. Um, so the question is the Tokyo government now, um, I'm kind of in a state of despair. Uh, and, and of course, about a lot of things, you know. Um, when I look about uh, what's happening with uh, Jingu Gaian and uh, you know cutting these trees, when I look at the fact, and I, I've learned this, you know, I'm very involved with Fukushima issues, and you know, uh, realized that um, there was no environmental impact assessment legally required before making very important decisions that would affect the environment a lot, and then seeing that uh, citizens themselves don't seem to expect that even, this is kind of, uh, makes me sad and makes me less optimistic for the future. Uh, I do see a lot of uh, greenwashing uh, by, the, by the government uh, and see that this, let's say this partnership between the construction industry, real estate developers uh, and government that, um, uh, Alex Carr points out so well in his book, Dogs and Demons, uh, this is continuous. And I see, you know, why are perfectly viable neighborhoods demolished to build uh, massive development at a time where we're beginning to see a population decline? Uh, and uh, the Tokyo city government, I guess, it was already 10 years ago, predicted by the end of the century, the population would decrease by half. So who's going to be living in and working in all of these buildings? And what's going to be left? Uh, whereas what had been there before probably would evolve and could accommodate uh, changes in population and scale. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of study, a lot of money devoted to it. Uh, I maybe feel better to some degree about, um, you know, we see that Tokyo uh, and the rest of the country dealt with its pollution uh, issue very, very well. This horrific pollution from the 1980s did that very, very well. I look at some of the developments, I mentioned Daimyo Koji, and I look at the uh, you know, Mitsubishi developments in you know, uh, Otomachi, et cetera, uh, which you know, I've been very, very skeptical of what they had accomplished, but I think they had actually improved the city. And again, that's a bit laissez-faire. This was not government doing, this was private developers. So there are some cases where uh, the environment has actually, I think, improved compared to what it was when I arrived. Uh, but um, I think as long as we have this strong uh, partnership, and I would have to call it a corrupt partnership between construction industry, uh, real estate, and government, we will continue to see what I might refer to as a mining of value. In other words, even during the bubble period, well, it was very clear, uh, lots of buildings being demolished just because of some potential real estate value, uh, leading to the decimation of viable neighborhoods. Uh, and then maybe the redevelopment happens, maybe it doesn't, maybe we have lots of cases where there were hundred in parking lots where neighborhoods once stood, and those parking lots lasted for 10 or 15 years or more. Uh, I think this is um, something that it's, it's a crisis of value for the city. 
uh, I have never accepted this uh, explanation that um, you know because of destruction, the earthquakes and the war bombing, etc., uh, uh, and the earthquakes in Japan, etc., that Japanese people uh, don't value or don't love their neighborhoods or don't want to continue uh, living in them and and to to keep that people uh, you know the sense of renewal is more important. I think people have sort of been bought uh, sold sold a bill of goods on that. Uh, that I do think when you actually see how people live. They clearly do value uh, their neighborhoods. They clearly do love where they live and would like that to continue. But when they are they're confronted with uh, a huge economic um, uh, potential or uh, economic potential of, of losing money, for instance, then they will all, almost always choose uh, the money. And this is to me uh, a, a kind of a crisis. And I don't know what the way is out of that. Although you, know, you mentioned that maybe society is catching up in some ways. Um, yeah, I see much more interest every every month. I look at Japanese architecture magazines and see uh, special, you know, issues or special articles about uh, renovation, about valuing old neighbors, about trying to find the the potential of that. But that is, uh, you know, kind of competing against this massive machinery of redevelopment that simply wants some kind of value out of the ground. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, I don't think it's doing it very well. That said, there are places that are. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to like Kamikatsu in Shikoku, Tokushima, uh, places that really have uh, addressed these issues. Very, it's a small population, but there is a lot of know-how. Uh, and there are a lot of places that are doing experiments in regions outside of Tokyo that are much better than a lot of what we see in Tokyo. Uh, we may find things, Saitama Prefecture, there's some good stories there, uh, some other places. I hope that answers a bit of a rambling reply. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, we are, we, we wanted to finish at uh, six, but uh, it has been so interesting that we have extended a little bit more. And I think it's, it's a perfect moment uh, now to, to finish with these uh, uh, observations and comments uh, with this kind of optimistic uh, <laughs> kind of view at the end that there are there are uh, many initiatives in, in the direction of, of the direction yes. that- You're uh, on as an example. Yeah, we are doing this kind of work also, but many young architects. So I think uh, uh, it is really, uh, 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 your, your book is very timely because now we are ready to understand uh, Edo and learn from it and actually implement it uh, in our projects. Right. So thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, and it was really an honor. Thank you so much for your lecture. It's wonderful. Thanks.